If President Trump is going to crack down on sanctuary cities, first, he'll need to define the term. Today, a congressman from Colorado drew a clear line with local cities on both sides. A neighborhood has tried to draw a line for a decade on something as simple as a sidewalk. Are we in the media talking about this president differently? Well, let's look back farther. A guy who walked away from an avalanche tells us how he survived. A going out of business sale with huge memories and tiny furniture. And a Colorado style smoked turkey is exactly what you think it is. And it's all next. Ignorantia juris nemenem excusa. Ignorance of the law is no defense. We're hearing several mayors in the metro area plead ignorantia when it comes to the definition of sanctuary cities. It looks like they're hoping it will provide an excuse out of defense as President Trump threatens to cut off federal funding to cities that his administration deems to be sanctuary cities. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock's typical answer on this topic goes something like, sanctuary city? Who? Us? You know, I don't know what a sanctuary city is. What we are is a, a city of compassion. And this week, Aurora Mayor Steve Hogan is saying the same. And they are right that there is no jurist, no law defining a sanctuary city. Today, Republican Congressman Mike Kaufman of Aurora suggested a definition by which to defund cities, a definition that would target only one in Colorado, Boulder. Kaufman tweeted today that he would vote to withhold fundings from cities that proclaim themselves sanctuaries. By Kaufman's standard, Denver and Aurora would skate, and Boulder would be high on the target list of a Trump administration. I'll be damned if this doesn't get done. That's what Denver City Councilman Paul Lopez told us today about a problem on a block in his part of southwest Denver. It seems like a simple fix, but if it was, it wouldn't have been shot down nine years running. Here's Dan Grossman. I'm putting my Christmas lights away. Taking down my Christmas lights. The first step in fixing any problem what's fast and what's easy, that's what I go for, is first admitting there is one. My girlfriend. <laughs> for Will Hargraves. I like to procrastinate, but she does not. That's not too hard to do. Now, only if the city would follow suit with what he says they've been procrastinating. Yeah, this is this is probably my biggest complaint of living right here, so. Will merely inherited this problem of no sidewalk after moving into his West Florida Avenue home two years ago. After nine years, me pursuing this, <laughs> I hope they actually do something, yeah. It was Will's neighbor, Lou Trujillo, and his now deceased father, Max, who first brought the icy danger to the city's attention in 2008. He didn't like the idea of uh, slipping and sliding the in the mud all the time. I'm going down the street here. This stretch of West Florida between Irving and Knox is the only stretch that has no sidewalk. It gets super icy along here in the winter time. Neighbors say plows push snow up onto the raised asphalt, forcing kids from the nearby middle schools into one of the main avenues that connects Denver to Lakewood. There's no curb, there's no gutter, the drainage is an issue, and people are walking in the street. Councilman Paul Lopez has taken the $125,000 proposal to the city council nine times in nine years. Each time, they've denied allocating general fund money to tackle the issue. I love my job, and, and I love representing my district, and I understand that there's a lot of issues that we have to deal with. But I'll be damned if in 10 years we cannot get this thing done. For those here, it's no longer a question of if. Yeah, it would be really great if they did something here. Yeah. It's demanding the answer of when. I care about it. Councilman Lopez says this issue spans much larger as other council members have pushed for more sidewalks in the city. Kyle, this one just happens to be a flashpoint. Yeah, obviously not the only sidewalk issue around the city, but there is a citywide policy that's at play here. Correct. So Denver does not have any dedicated funding source for building any sidewalks across the city. They'll only build them if they are creating new side, uh, new buildings, public facilities, sure. or if they are doing road construction. This year, however, they are dedicating two and a half million dollars to build about eight miles of sidewalks around parks that we lack them. All right. Very interesting. Thanks so much, Dan. You bet. The last obstacle that stands between veterans and care at the VA hospital in Denver is not red tape. It's a sheet of ice. It's in front of the building at 9th and Claremont. People arriving for medical appointments should not need to bring ice skates in order to get there safely. We gave Denver Public Works a shout on this. They added it to the list of icy spots that need to be cleared with the city's fancy motor grader. You can report a trouble spot you've seen by calling 311 and please do be nice when you call because those folks hear nothing but complaints all day long. May I make a recommendation and it won't cost any extra, not like the 20% extra that goods from Mexico would cost if the Trump administration follows through on the plan floated by its press secretary today. 
a 20% tax on Mexican goods. The Washington Post has an excellent analysis that explains what that would cost American uh, citizens. The administration wants to fund its $25 billion project to build a wall on the Mexican border through some type of tariff like this. So that would push the price of an avocado from $3 to $3.60. And Americans would need to buy $20 billion of them to fund the wall. Or Americans could buy about $40 million more LG refrigerators. Those are made in Mexico. They'd be subject to the tariff. The cost of a six-pack of Tecate beer would go from $6 to $7.20. And Americans would need to buy 10 billion more six packs of Tecate to fund the president's wall. You're thinking that's the route that I'm going to recommend because I'm the beer guy. And that is precisely why I cannot in good faith recommend that anyone increase their consumption of Tecate. Pacifico maybe, not Tecate. Sorry, I have to find another way to build that wall. Castilla County is so buried in snow that the state's emergency operations center is helping to coordinate the digging out process. The state's resources plus a guy named Jim. Jim Christensen has a farm near Blanca. He watches next, so we know that Jim's a good guy. And he tells us the snow in the San Luis Valley is being swept this way and that's piled in huge drifts along the county roads. He's thrown tire chains on the old 1959 Dodge Power Wagon so that he can get out and feed the cows. Jim tells us that truck has been in the family ever since it was new. The simple fact that the man that we're about to meet is able to talk to us is, in his words, a miracle. Earlier this month, an avalanche swept him off a cliff. He and his skis were buried under 10 feet of snow. Jeremy Bird and his friend Mark Hemlick were up country, backcountry skiing in the Deer Creek area of Coalbank Pass. And Jeremy is alive today because of Mark and because of the precautions they took. Mark was able to find Jeremy where he was buried using a radio beacon and an avalanche probe. He started digging him out alone until help got there. I could move my right arm, so I was trying, I was concentrating on trying to dig toward the surface, which I didn't realize how deep I was. And when I felt his probe hit my back, and then he pulled it out, and the probe hit my arm, I knew at that point I was going to be okay. It's definitely shifted the way that I look at the mountain and the way that I will ski, I'm, I'm sure. Jeremy was also wearing an Avalong, that's the blue tube-like device over his shoulder. That allowed him to breathe underneath the snow until he was rescued. Certainly not everyone who's prepared survives an avalanche, but it is hard to see how he would have survived otherwise. This next story isn't about a firefighter who got caught lighting fire somewhere or an animal control officer caught abusing pets. No, this next story is about public servants doing the right thing, like 99% of them do every day and never make the news for it. They're the good ones, and they're almost all good ones. The Loveland Fire Department and Larimer County Humane Society came to the rescue yesterday for Dilly, a dog missing since December 29th. She was spotted yesterday in a neighborhood in Loveland, eventually found down a storm drain. The firefighters and the Humane Society removed the big grate and pulled Dilly free. And despite that month on the run, she's doing okay. Checked out by a vet and now back home with family. You're certainly welcome to send next a tip about someone who's doing something wrong. We investigate those all the time. But we also want to hear about people doing right in our community. You can get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. A milestone for Rocky Mountain National Park that doesn't involve tourists stacked up 10 deep to watch elk flirt. It's always been family run and it's part of our life. They've been in the business of putting people in homes, tiny people in tiny homes for a very long time. And Danielle Grant says your weekend is going to be hot. As in, like the weather, your plans still up to you. She's a meteorologist, not a magician. Next. I wonder if they realized 102 years ago today when Rocky Mountain National Park first opened to the public, wonder if they realized that someday it would become one of the greatest draws in all of America. 415 square miles of nature, unnaturally preserved, so that we might go there and imagine America without Americans. Rocky is special, the word has long been out, and the challenge now as it begins its 102nd year is how to balance its popularity with its pristine places.
certainly a beautiful place to visit no matter the season. Plenty of snowfall up there and chilly temperatures right now here in the city. 31 all we could do. Typically our temperatures should be sitting in the mid 40s. We'll get there. We just got a while to wait tonight. Bitter cold yet again. We're down to about eight degrees. We'll have a few clouds overhead, but the winds kicking up going to make it feel even chillier out there. We're talking about single digits for eastern Colorado teens across the eastern plains and well below zero once you move up into the mountains. A bitter cold night, the snowfall coming to an end by tomorrow morning, just kind of a mix of the sun and clouds across the city. And that's the way we wind down our Friday evening. Clear skies yet again means another chilly night. It's January 37. That's our daytime high on tap tomorrow. We'll go with mostly sunny skies throughout the day, but those winds still kicking up out of the northwest. It'll still be a, just kind of have that bite in the air out there. 40s in Sterling and Ray, 20s up in the high country and yes, I'm bringing the heat for the weekend. How does that look? Mid 40s on Saturday, low 50s on Sunday, close to 60 degrees on Monday. And then as we head toward next week, the start of February, no real changes, Kyle, just lots of sun. Bring the heat, D. Grant. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hey, they've been building houses since 1978. Now the family behind Norms and Centennial is closing its business with a large sale on some very small home furnishings. I'm not sure how to put it into words. It's been our home away from home, that's for sure. I'm uh, Norma Nielsen. My husband was Norman Ray Nielsen. His father was Norman Nielsen, and our oldest son is Norman Scott Nielsen. We uh, built a dollhouse for our youngest daughter back in 1970. Norm built the little dollhouse in our garage, and I helped decorate it, and we had so much fun that he kind of got going on building dollhouses for neighborhood girls, and it went from there. February 5th will be our anniversary, so that we will have completed 39 years at that time. Started out hand cutting shingles oh, for wow. Dad out in the garage, oh, wow. just one at a time. Is it really, really bad? Bad. Very bad, yeah. It looks like you've pretty much cleaned up. It's, we've had a good sale, yeah. Got a lot to go, but, yeah, but we've got till March 15th. The interest is still there, but unfortunately people like to stay home and order their goods on the internet. It's always been family run and it's part of our life, so it's gonna be different. So March 15th will be our last day. You got it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's time. I'll be 80 next month, so Perfect. it's time. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. A lot of families made a lot of memories there. You heard her mention March 15th is the closing date. Norma's son David's going to keep an online business going after that. email inbox is filled with people who think we are treating this president differently. We dig into the Nine News archives to see if it's true. And it's high time someone smoked a turkey, Colorado style. I was surprised that it uh, tasted as good as it did. Is this illegal? Dunno, not our problem. Next. Number one is not enough. For thousands of viewers, we're the only one, and that's a big responsibility. At Nine News, we hired the best people, bought the best equipment, more action cams, Sky 9, color radar, and the best news team in Colorado. Because number one is not enough. Being best is Nine News. This Throwback Thursday, we look at presidents past, considering the comments we've been getting, suggesting that we're talking about President Trump differently. Our Steve Steger went digging through our archives to get a bit of perspective. And Kyle, we did. We looked all through the archives, grabbed two air checks of newscasts from this day after President Obama's inauguration and this day after President Reagan's inauguration. Let's start more recently. When President Obama was sworn in, the country was recovering from the late 2000s financial crisis. Still recovering, as you could tell from Greg Moss's Money Report. 
Americans. And although Colorado is expected to fare a little bit better than the rest of the country when all is said and done by the end of the year, it is likely going to be another rough six months, according to the National Association for Business Economists. In its latest survey, more than half the participants expect the economy will shrink more than 1% this year, with significant job reductions through attrition or layoffs through at least the second quarter. All right, 2009, not far enough back. We wanted to see what was going on during the first days of President Reagan's administration. So I grabbed the tape from 1981. The Iran hostage crisis had just ended. The hostages were released the day of the inauguration, including one man from Colorado, Sergeant William Gallegos. On January 26th, then Nine News reporter Rick Salinger sent this story from Washington, where Gallegos' parents visited their recently released son. It was called the Day of Solitude, yet at mid-afternoon, Dick and Teresa Gallegos came out to chat with reporters. How's Chloe? Oh, they're all great. They feel great, they're happy, they're, they look good. Still, reporters numbering over 100 wait in the cold night air, hoping for a chance to speak with the celebrated 52. Been there, done yeah. that. So yeah, maybe the rhetoric is a little bit different mm -hmm. in the time after the campaign, but there were much different issues going on during each of these transitions. But monumental things happening all the time. I think we sometimes think that we're living in some unique moment in history. Certainly the personalities are unique. President Trump is unique, but there's always something going. Perhaps the most monumental was the Reagan sure. administration. On inauguration day, the day those hostages were released. Yes, indeed. Steve Sager, many thanks for that, and many thanks for filling in for the last three days. Of course. Didn't burn Anytime. the place to the ground. I, I appreciate tried. that yeah. very much. Yeah. <laughs> Kept the seat warm. Thank you, sir. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a weed-smoked turkey. Kind of makes sense. You can smoke turkey. You can smoke marijuana. Company in Colorado has combined the two. Don't we live in interesting times? Typically, you know, baked and smoked would be two different categories of food, but I suppose not. At Cook's Fresh Market in downtown Denver, where they are now offering a weed smoked natural turkey and a weed roasted natural turkey sandwich. The owner of the deli says, He's always wondered how turkey would taste smoked with marijuana instead of like applewood chips or something. One of his customers brought him some marijuana stalks this week, so he tried it out. Brined the turkey with sugar, salt, and spices for three days and then proceeded to smoke it with the marijuana six hours over low heat. I was really surprised that the smell was, it didn't smell like uh, marijuana burning. It had a sweet aroma, you know, like a cherry wood. And uh, it was absolutely delicious. Some people are afraid to try it. Some people are like, wow, this is really good. So it's, you know, people are kind of um, sort of surprised and uh, they're, uh, they're, they're talking about it. That they are. Ed says he's not planning on it being a regular item on the menu. We asked him, so Ed, is this illegal? He says he didn't hear anything about it being illegal, but he says He'll see what happens after this story airs, whether he'll do it again. For the record, we do not recommend testing out your possibly illegal ideas via stories broadcast on Next, but we won't stop you. Hashtag hey next or email next at 9news.com. We hear from you when we return. A stack of your feedback now. David and Jan pointed out that we should have given you an address for Norm's Dollhouse Shop, which closed this for the last time March 15th. It's South Colorado and Dry Creek. There you go if you want to swing by. Brennan Martin asked, Kyle, what's your problem with Tecate? I don't have a problem with it. I just prefer it slightly less than every other beer made on earth. Tanya Welker Nelson says, thanks for the shout out to Loveland Fire and Larimer Humane. They did great work. Always looking to highlight that in our community. And Mike and Brenda Patrick asked, Kyle, did the A-Line bring you back? It did. I was supposed to get back two days ago. I'll see you next time. <laughs>